So Samson and Delilah have what is, what would have to be considered a complicated relationship. They did have one advantage, they're a cisgender couple, right? So at least they had that going for them. But they're crossing over some boundaries. They're crossing some boundaries. They're clearly from two different cultures. They are clearly on two different sides of a conflict with Samson and Delilah's people at odds with each other. But one thing is interesting here. They, like many couples today, have some issues with trust. Maybe it starts out because Samson is in love with Delilah and Delilah is in love with Silver. Although we've seen that relationship work in our world today, haven't we? TMZ will give you examples about it every day in the news. Samson was in love with Delilah, but Delilah was loyal to those who stood against Samson. It's like Romeo and Juliet, except imagine Juliet's only in it to bring down the Montagues. It's like Superman and Lois Lane, but imagine Lois is only in it so she can learn about the secrets of kryptonite and how to subdue him. It's like the first season of Game of Thrones, except, no, actually, it's just like that. <laughs> Almost exactly like that. Samson and Delilah have a complicated relationship. It's one of those scriptures that tells us exactly what not to do instead of being some model for biblical family values. Samson and Delilah have a complicated relationship. It starts with the fact that he's in love with her and she's in cahoots with his enemy. He's emotionally invested in her. She's invested in the political outcome of the conflict. Then there's the trust issue. Even with all the love he has for her, which seems to be enormous based on his level of stupidity, he doesn't trust her, nor should he. And on her side, she's done absolutely nothing to earn trust. And then we get to boundaries. Last week, we started kind of a series of sermons we're going to look at on personal boundaries. We talked about burdens, the things that are too heavy for us to carry, when we can ask for help. And we talked about loads and cargo, those responsibilities that are ours, that we carry, that give us strength, that give, uh, give us pride when we take on our responsibilities rather than dumping them off on someone else. That balance of boundaries and carrying our own load, lifting up our burdens for others to help with, and lifting up our accomplishments to grow. Last week we talked about naming where we need help while claiming responsibility. And we talked about not helping others when they don't need help, right? There's the making sure I don't throw my needs on other people, but also that I don't help them when they don't need it, when they need to do it for themselves, when they need to accomplish something and feel that sense of pride to succeed, that we don't take away their opportunity to grow. Today, we're narrowing in a little bit more on some specific boundaries, relational boundaries. Cloud and Townsend, in their book, Boundaries, because they're good writers but not creative when it comes to naming a book, apparently, lift up some laws of boundaries. They talk about reaping and sowing, that what we put into relationships is what we get out, whether it's families, children, friends, or romance, that we tend to have consequences for the ways we interact. They also lift up responsibility in relationship, a law of responsibility. We're responsible for ourselves and to others. We're not responsible for others. We can't control what they do. We're responsible to them, to be accountable for our behavior, to make sure we are good stewards of our community, good partners in relationship, that we're honest with each other, that we play our role in the relationship. We are responsible to each other that way, but not for each other. We can't control our partners. We can't control our family. We have to own our stuff and name our own problems, and we have to share our hurts, share our pain, our feelings with each other, so that we're being honest with each other about where we're at. They lift up power, claiming the power we have over ourselves and the lack of power we have to control anyone else. That makes sense, right? For example, you can keep yelling, I can't stop you from that, but I can leave the room. I can't control you, but I can control where I am. 
I can't stop you from drinking or using drugs, but I can take the rest of the family and go. You're welcome to keep on with your behavior because I can't control it, but I can control what I expose my children to or myself to. Understanding power, what we can control and what we can't. And then there's the law of evaluation. Am I respecting someone else's boundaries or not? Are they respecting mine or not? And they say the way to do this is to look at loving and caring as a way to respond to boundaries. If somebody says, no, that's not okay with me. Do we respond or do others respond with an understanding, with compassion, with respect? Or do we push those boundaries? And those who violate simple boundary requests prove themselves in a power dynamic to be controlling and oppressor. Looking at reaping what we sow, claiming our responsibility, naming issues of power, and having the courage to really evaluate relationships, according to Cloud and Tansen, allow us to see what type of relationship we're really in. What are we exposing ourselves to in a relationship? What's it about? They suggest that we share boundaries openly that we talk about where we need them to be in a relationship. There's complete transparency in a safe relationship. In a real relationship where both people share power, we know what the expectations, needs, hurts, and hopes of another person are. Boundaries is not a game. It's not a mind-reading experiment. We have to express where our boundaries are through words, through our physical space, emotional distance, the time we commit to things, the support we get from other relationships, leaning on counselors, groups, friends for advice and support, having other relationships, not putting all the pressure on one, and then also expressing consequences. If someone crosses our boundary, we say no and here's what happens. If a child misbehaves and you say, you're in big trouble, now let's all go play. Are there consequences? No. If you've told a partner 10 times, when you do this, I will leave, and you never leave, have there been real consequences? No, you've actually encouraged the boundary to be broken. You've shown that it's okay. We have to start learning to set clear boundaries and articulate them in our relationships. So instead of picking apart our relationships, which is absolutely no fun at all, Let's look back at scripture and take a big swing at Samson and Delilah. How's that sound? Samson starts out playing along with destructive behaviors. Playing along with destructive behaviors. He's being tested to see if he really loves Delilah. If you love me, you'll tell me the secret to your strength. Now there's a couple issues here to start with. One, they have forged a relationship where she doesn't really know him. And two, she's testing him with what she doesn't know. Both of them have some boundary issues here, right? He's keeping things secret from her, and she's testing him. It creates a destructive pattern that gives them more and more reason to distrust each other. Samson is frustrated, but he doesn't share that with her. He just tries to appease her. So he gives her another excuse that it could be. He doesn't name the problem. He doesn't name his feelings about being betrayed. He just gives her another story to pacify her. Samson keeps playing games instead of taking control for his own safety. Yes, the biggest, strongest man that we have in scripture, the story of the biggest, baddest soldier that ever lived on Israelite side is an abused partner. I want to make sure we catch on to that. It's not about his physical strength. It's emotional abuse, right? And she's eventually going to tie him up and turn him over to others. I would consider that physical abuse. Don't know about you and your relationships. I don't know if you've ever had family try to tie you up, bind you, and sell you off. But it has nothing to do with his size. It reminds me of a podcast I heard earlier this year with Terry Crews. Are you all familiar with Terry Crews? The biggest, baddest, old spice salesman you've ever seen on a commercial. 
He was the big, super jacked guy that made his pecs go back and forth on the commercials that then had jets propel him up into the air out of his feet. He's now hosting America's Got Talent. And he has told his own story in the Me Too movement of being sexually abused. It came through his management company and he was afraid it would kill his career. But then he watched others standing up for themselves and felt that he needed to say something too about what had happened to him, how someone had crossed his boundaries and how fearful he was to do anything about it. And as he watched women who were smaller than him, that had less power than him speaking up, he got onto his phone and he tweeted out what had happened to him. And then in a moment of clarity, he quickly called his wife and warned her what he had just done. As he shares the story, there was a fear of maintaining a boundary of what he might lose. I'm not sure what Samson's afraid of losing. How deeply in love is he? How lonely is he being this superhero soldier? How broken is he emotionally? What's he scared of losing? Whatever it is, he continues to allow her to trample his boundaries and abuse him in the relationship. He doesn't put how he feels into words. He doesn't share his boundaries. He doesn't say, you're not going to keep doing things to hurt me. He doesn't say, you will not test me. That's not healthy. He doesn't say, you will not open your home to people who wish to harm me. Samson could have used a lot of tools that we've talked about already to draw clear boundaries. He could have articulated his anger. He could have slept in a different room than her. He could have slept in a different house from her. He could have emotionally stepped back so that he was not hooked by her. He could have taken some time away from Delilah. He could have asked for advice, a support group, a counselor, a priest. Samson could have had real consequences for the betrayals. Imagine if he suggested they move away from her hometown and all those people that she was hooked by that didn't care about his safety. Imagine he said, let's just sleep in separate rooms for a while and put locks on the door. Imagine he had the courage to leave her. Now, now that we've taken some time safely away from our own relationships, now that we've taken some time away from our own hurts and worries and focused on somebody else and how they could do it better, I want to invite you to think about your own relationships. It doesn't have to be a romance. It can be a parent relationship, a sibling, a friend. Why are we in these relationships? What draws you into relationship? Is it DNA and birth? Is it common interests? Have you been power dating? Are you scared of being alone? Are you in search of safety and stability? Was it tequila? Why are we in relationships? Family bonds, shared history, society's expectations? It's interesting, as we did some of our LGBTQ training this last year on gender identity, we named some different reasons people are connected. We started with understanding our own identity, that the sex we're assigned at birth sometimes doesn't match how we feel about ourselves. Our gender identity and our reality may be two different, physical reality may be two different things. And then there's our expression of it, how do we share it? And then there's who we're attracted to, which is completely different than how we see ourselves. But then our trainer brought up something different. She says, and then there's who you have sex with. And I thought, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. If I know who I'm attracted to and I know who am I, then, then I know who I would want to be with. And it hit me. A lot of people are in relationships that aren't healthy for them and they stay in it for safety. There are those who do it out of force, human trafficking. Those who do it out of societal expectations. There are so many things that go into the relationships we hold on to that cause us to break down safe boundaries, to sacrifice a part of our self where we lose a piece of our own soul for someone else. Why are we in the relationships we are in? Is it love? Do 
Do they bring joy? Are we growing together? Why are we in the relationship? If there is not love, if there is not respect, if there is not a shared joy, if we are not growing together, then there's a chance that we are sacrificing more than we are getting. There's a chance we are sacrificing to an unhealthy level. A couple of weeks ago, we did a conversation after church about what is healthy sacrifice. And as a community, our wisdom, and I love your all's words, is that a sacrifice is one that's freely given, that feeds both people and has no strings attached. Do our relationships reflect that? Do they ask us to give up something that costs us ourself? Why are we in relationship? And how are our boundaries? How are we doing on our boundaries? Do we have a good balance of personal identity and time and shared identity and time? Do we try to fix others and make demands? Or do we own what's ours and let theirs be theirs? How do we do on our balance? Have we named what we need? Have we named it? Have we shared how we feel? Have we named our limits, our expectations, what we hope to get from others and what we expect of them? Have we talked about it together, openly? Have we named our boundaries? Have we heard the boundaries of others? Have we enforced our boundaries? Have we respected the boundaries of others. Samson didn't. He became angry, bitter, confused. He betrayed his values in exchange for affection. He exchanged his values for affection. He lost sight of what was important to him. And I wonder what might have been different if Samson and Delilah had set some good boundaries from the beginning. I wonder if he had raised the issue of expectations from the beginning of the relationship. Imagine it goes like this. Delilah, I am in love with you. And she says, you're a good looking guy and I'm a single woman in a culture that abuses women. I don't really love you the way you love me, but I need security. And I'll join with you. Now that would be an honest relationship, right? At least they would know where each other are coming from. He wouldn't be surprised when he is betrayed for further security. She may not have felt the need to make a side deal for more security. I wonder what would have happened if they had had good boundaries. What if he had left her at the first betrayal? What if Samson had left Delilah at the first betrayal? I wonder if she would have come seeking him. I wonder if she would have left the silver behind and come looking for the relationship that left and not taken it for granted. I wonder if she had shared her anger at being lied to, not manipulating, not if you loved me, you would tell me, but how it really made her feel inside. I wonder if they'd talked about the tension between their home communities, set a boundary with some home families and the roles they played in the relationship. I wonder what would have happened if they had good boundaries. I don't know. I wonder the same thing about us. I wonder what might happen if we practiced good boundaries in our families and in our romance, with our friends, with potential lovers. I wonder what might happen if we practiced good boundaries I wonder what might happen if we practiced good boundaries. It's not that hard to name it. It's not that hard to see what we should do. The hard part is living it. Controlling what we can ourselves, right? Letting go of what we can't, controlling others, and naming our desires and feelings in a relationship. Those are the core of all the boundary conversations. You can summarize Townsend and Cloud and every other person who's ever written on boundaries down to that. Owning what's ours, not controlling others, 
and making sure we are honest about our needs, desires, and expectations. The next step, of course, is consequences, and that's where it gets hard. How do we have the courage to have consequences to our boundaries? I think one of the answers is in this room. This family that supports each other. I have had the joy of watching you support each other as you've navigated difficult families. I've had the joy of watching you all support each other as you navigate difficult chemical dependencies. I've had the joy of watching you all support each other as you deal with health care issues in yourself, what you can and can't control. Having people around you to encourage you, to invite your honesty, to listen to you with authenticity, to hear you, to have people to tell you you'll be okay without them. Or it's okay to make room for them. To have people to be our sounding board, to be a family of faith, to be companions on the journey. Together, maybe, just maybe, we can balance what keeps the world from toppling us over with that that we desperately need to engage. Maybe we can find the balance in what we need and what we can give. Then, then maybe we can live into the love we deserve. Live into the love we deserve, not just in couples, in families and communities, and we will be equipped to be the safe place that others need. We can earn the love we deserve. We can live in to the love we deserve and be the people God hopes us to be. Amen.